Um, today we're going to talk about a century of change, the historic permanent quadrats. Uh, some of you are very familiar with this, and some of you may know a little bit, and some of you may know absolutely nothing about it. Um, we've been uh, charting the quadrats for 101 years, and Darren is going to talk about the data, and I'm just going to talk about a little bit of the history. In uh, 1915, when the quadrats were established, it was under the Hornada Range Reserve, which was at that time under, it had just been put under control of the Forest Service. And so these are some maps I came across from around 1915, the, the big map of the Hornada. I don't know if you can see on there, <coughs> they've mapped out different vegetation types. This wasn't built in, this was just a, a map where they had already plotted where the vegetation types were. <coughs> and then what they would do is they would enlarge the different pastures and color in the vegetation types. So you have a key up here. And when I was uh, looking at this, I, I thought, oh, hey, there's some writing down in that corner. And so I enlarged it, and it says S. Coville, December 1915, rena um, reconnaissance L.C. Hurt and S. Coville in August of 1915. So my guess on the large map was uh, pretty good. So this is what the Hornada looked at. We only had 11 pastures in 1915. <clears throat> and uh, I think it was, they did a lot of work going out there and mapping all of that. Okay, so as I said, 1915 the Forest Service took over. Uh, from 1912 to 1915, it was under the Bureau of Plant Industry. And so, okay, between 1915 and 1932, more than 150 one-meter quadrats were established all over the Hornada. And um, during that time, some of the series were dropped and um, individual quadrats were dropped. So at this time, we do 120. Uh, 122 quadrats. The majority of those are black grama, then uh, tobosa and other minor ones. The blue grama is up in the mountains in the foothills of the San Andres, and the one poor little jip drop seed is out in the middle of pasture 12A. And this shows the location of the quadrats that we uh, currently chart. And we do the charting every five years, starting in uh, 19, they were done in 1995, and then in 2001 we did them, and then we've done them every five years since then. So in two, two, 2016 was the last time we uh, charted all of them. And Darren will tell you all the other years. He's got them memorized. <laughs> Initially they were done once a year, sometimes more than once a year, but he'll go into all of that. And when they were set up, a lot of the series were set up in a line um, with, well, heading away from the water source. So you have B1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then the A series. And they were, the quadrats were from the western side of the Hornada all the way up into the mountains. We have S1 and S2 over here, and S3 through 6 in the foothills and then all over in the, the middle. And you can see um, from Southwell, the N series, the U series, and from headquarters, uh, G series. And uh, I, most of these were initially black grandma. And you notice I say most of these. Darren will tell you more about that. And I'll show you some pictures, too. Um, <clears throat> let's see. So that's a, 122 quadrats we've got there. Now we'll look at the methods for charting the quadrats. From 1915 until 1924, they used what's called a decimeter grid. Basically, it's a metal frame and then divided with wire into 10 centimeter squares. And uh, now, from 1925 through today, we use a, um, a panograph to chart the quadrats, it <clears throat> basically what it does, one person, it takes two people to run it, one person has a stylus, and the other person has a sheet of paper and a pencil that's mounted to one of the arms of the um, quadrat. And so the person that's mapping it goes around on, the, for the items that are charted are the basal area, 
of perennial grasses, uh, canopy cover of shrubs, the locations of perennial forbs, and um, annuals are just counted. And then the, this is uh, one of the 1915, June 1915 quadrat charts, and this is chart or quadrat B1, and then we have the 2016 chart from B1. So what they did on these was they had the frame down on the quadrat, and there are corner markers on these. And uh, uh, originally, I think they were just nails, and today we've got angle iron, so we know exactly where the frame goes on it. And so they would sit there with their clipboard, I'm assuming, and this piece of paper, and they would draw. And on some of these, this isn't very clear, but you can see the individual lines that are connecting the lines on the chart paper. So I think it was a very long and tedious process to do that. We think it's long and tedious some days. We've got some quadrats that take us over an hour to chart. And then um, they're, they're labeling. So they've got G for grandma, they've got P for panicled grass, and then they've got a, a few other things there. <coughs> and so we just use the uh, USDA codes for ours. And, uh, and we also mark north on ours. We're assuming that theirs are all oriented north, but we don't know exactly for sure, but we do mark that. Oh, and this is, this is just a, um, an area, so with this area, the whole area of that would be calculated, and this is how we usually designate our canopies. There wasn't a canopy in this particular one, but I just drew that on there. Okay, and then after the charting is done, you have to do something to pull the data out of it. Um, since, what, 95, they've been digitized? And, and some of the older ones have also been digitized, right? Yes. Darren's going to talk about that. And so you digitize it, and you get areas for all of the polygons um, from 1915 until the days of digitization. They would have to sit there and calculate, count the squares on the chart and various other methods for calculating the area. And this is their plant list. I just love this plant list. It's almost illegible <laughs> between the, the typewriter and the handwritten notes in there. And, uh, and no scientific names are very few. So there's, there's this translation process that's going on between the older data and the new data. And here's our plant list from 2016. So. And then we get into some photographic comparisons. So, um, so we have 1933 Cassidy and Keller, and this is at Quadrat S5 up near Rope Springs. And in 2016, we have Romig and Slaughter, same location, doing the same quadrat. And um, I think this is the same black gram or blue gram growing in both plots. Maybe not, but it is still there. And uh, some of the changes that have gone on in that time is that the world has gone from black and white to color. And in 2001, the women took over. <laughs> <laughs> now we'll look at some individual plots. So this is quadrat A4, and this is um, one, of, one that's over on the west side in kind of a transition zone. And you can see that originally it was grass. I believe that one was black, was black grandma, yes. black grandma area. And uh, so I've got a series, 1935, 1952. I was very happy to find these pictures. And then uh, less than two weeks ago, Amy and I went out and uh, Reed took some pictures out there. And so this is the same plot. And um, can anybody tell me what the difference is between these plots? Color. <laughs> yes, better. color, color. What? What's the soil's the, better. Yes, the soil's better. Okay, we've got two things. There's one more, one more. Um, there's kind of this prickly looking thing here. The mosquito moved in. And uh, 
And you can see this is the overhead shot. This is, this mesquite is on the south side of the plot. And so when we take this, the overhead picture, we stand on the north side so that we don't get shadows in it. But you can see that this mesquite has uh, made a, a pretty good inroads into this. But you can see there's also dieback in there. They come and go. So there's a four and then this is one that I like, AR2, which is an Aristida plot. So this is up north of uh, Wagoner Well. And uh, you can see this rain gauge, same rain gauge in all of the pictures. And I don't know if you can see this, the same rain gauge. And you can see the um, dune there with the mesquite on it. And the rain gauge, there's a band of rust where the um, band used to be it, so they raised the rain gauge up over the years. And again, you can see there's mesquite. It looks like it's overshadowing that, but in reality, it hasn't quite gotten that far. But the, that plot has been bare, I think, all but one year that we've gone out there. And this is a series from MG6 which is, um, it's kind of a mixed area. There's black grandma out there, <coughs> but there's also tobosa. And the grass that's actually in the plot is tobosa. And all, oh wait, this is MG6, yeah, 1935. No 1952 picture, and then 2017. And um, yeah, one of the things I liked about this, if I move that down some, is you can see a dark shrub up at the top. That's an ephedra, same shrub up here, ephedra here, ephedra here, same ephedra here and here. So that's amazing, 80, what, 80 some years later, 82 years later, the same, some of the same plants are still there. Uh, there's actually a lot of black grama around here. You can see the tobosa in the middle there, but there's a very good stand of black grama around there. And then S5, back to the foothills, and uh, again, we have some interesting things. Uh, the grass, the, oh, and the black and white pictures are all drought years. So the 19, the drought of the 30s and the drought of the 50s. It would have been nice if they'd taken some pictures at other times too. But I know, they didn't have digital cameras so they couldn't take thousands of pictures like we do. Um, so S5. You can see the yucca baccata in these two areas, and this juniper is still there. It's much smaller in 1935, but it's still there. And uh, the blue grandma, there's a, it's a mix of blue grandma and black grandma up in the foothills. And I think that's it. Any <laughs> So uh, given how this is one of our post, maybe this is our premier data set, it's surprising how out of shape the data actually is. So it's, uh, you, you can think of how many uh, charts we, we actually have. Um, uh, part of the permanent record, there are 131 different quadrats. Only tw uh, 122 are being, currently being sampled. The other nine have been lost. But there are these mystery quadrats we have charts for. Um, actually, Connie and Amy found two new quadrats last week that they literally stumbled upon that we might start sampling again. But with our current record of these 131 permanent quadrats, we have 5,668 charts like this one. Some of them, granted, are blank. There's the, the entire quadrat is, is empty. But others are very compl complex in charting the, um, the basal areas and shrub canopies. Um, the thing that may be surprising to you is that the entire data record has never been compiled. Um, pieces, large pieces of it have been put together, but the whole thing has never been put together. Um, there's at least 1,200 original charts that have never been copied, and there's at least 155 charts that we don't even have, uh, we don't even know what the data uh, on them is. Nobody has entered it, nobody has copied it. All these are just sitting over there in the uh, cabinets, and if they were lost, you would have no replacements for them. So this is the, um, I'm, I'm trying to show 
the, uh, the whole record of, of charting. So the, um, starting in 1915 all the way to 2016, um, the blue indicates how many times per year the quadrat was sampled. So between zero and three times per year. You can see at the beginning they were sampled more frequently, and then there was this period uh, after 1980 where they were disbanded, or, uh, and then Chris, ha Chris Habstad restarted up the sampling in 1995, and now we're sampling at um, five to six year intervals. And so the current state of the data processing, this is digitizing. All of these red ones have not been digitized. Uh, the cool thing about digitizing is that um, we can actually chart over time what actually happens to the basal areas of the, um, the, per the grasses. So you can see in quadrant A1 with this animation, uh, the, the polygons are kind of dancing around. That's how the basal area of the grasses are changing over time. And the, um, uh, this takes a lot of work to actually do, but I think part of the, the real power of what the data set tells is sort of um, site specific or quadrat specific. So what have we learned from the data set so far? Well, there's been several papers back in the 70s. This guy, Gerald Wright, um, wrote about his, his uh, method for computer processing of the, ch the charts. We no longer do it this way. He also um, uh, wrote a paper that we're even in, in, uh, in the late 70s. You can't quite see it because the resolution is so bad. But he was considering this a long-term data set back in the late 70s. Um, then Bob Gibbons, who's a Hornada scientist, um, wrote about how th this, um, uh, first of all, in the, in the context of the transition from grassland to shrubland on a large scale, he's talking about how plant dominance classes have increased and how uh, that new diversity should be taken into consideration in the context of grazing. And that, but the most comprehensive paper that's been written was by Gene Yao and Deb Peters back in 2006, where uh, they were looking mostly in the context of the, the big drought in the 1950s, how that affected um, the perennial grasses at different scales. So um, comparing, to what I think is, is powerful is looking at these two quadrats, quadrat A1 and, and B1, we have a um, photograph in the 1930s and then we have the photographs from today. Uh, the, the big difference is a1 turned to uh, mesquite, and B1 is still in perennial grass. We think that um, th these are actually located uh, quite close together, just over a mile apart, over by Westwell. But we think that the difference here is, be is because of the heavy winter grazing that pasture to south received. Um, but the, the cool thing about having this long data record is that we can map this, or we can chart this explicitly. So you can see how both the, the cover, basal cover of Black Rama crashed here in, in the early 1950s. Um, A1 never recovered, but B1 did. And we can relate that obviously to the precipitation where we had this massive drought uh, with several consecutive years of below average rainfall and also record low rainfall. So uh, the cool thing about having all of the a uh, quadrat data set compiled and together is that we can look at the, the same sort of trend in Black Grandma. We can look at it over all of the quadrats. So here um, I'm showing you, um, th these are all the quadrats that have been digitized uh, thus far. The blue ones are quadrats where Black Grandma still e exists. It's still live today, or was live in the 2016 sampling. The brown ones are quadrats where it's died out. So you can see uh, generally there's this crash where the 50s uh, drought happened, but not in every case. Some of them recovered faster than others. Um, and more uh, site-specific, uh, or, or studying the site-specific effects at each quadrat might help us elucidate uh, why the, what, where the differences might be. So uh, Brandon suggested, you know, we've, we've noticed this increase in sprobolus after the wet years of 20, 20, 2006 and 2012 where these previously bare interdunal spaces have been colonized by uh, sporobolus, mostly mesodropsy. Here at the um, Hornex Mesquite site, 
Connie has this nice um, series of pictures where you can see in 2006, the interdunal space here was totally bare, but then the um, sprobolus co uh, comes in, uh, but now in 2015, it's actually starting to recede. So the question is, does, with our current, um, uh, the current state of, of the quadrats, can we actually see events like this happen, uh, or, or this event happen? Um, and then can we identify periods in the past where this has happened before? And the answer is yes. So um, in many cases, well, you can see in, in the late, uh, the, the last uh, 20 years or last 15 years, there's often these peaks in the sprobolus where the colonization came in. However, uh, there are many cases where colonization never happened, even in quadrants that previously had sprobolus in them. So uh, this would be an opportunity. And um, in fact, there's almost any pattern that you are kind of looking, could possibly be looking for. There are quadrats where sprobolus never occurred throughout the record and then suddenly it popped up. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on. Depending on which, um, what species we, we pick, Aristida is probably a little more ephemeral, but uh, the AR um, quads were actually explicitly set up to study Aristida. Many of them, the Aristida disappeared in the 50s and has never come back, but there's other quadrats where Aristida has colonized and then moved out. If we look at Muhlenbergia, this is lumping all to species. There's also some um, interesting patterns. Uh, a mesquite, in general, uh, has an, up, an increasing trend. So there are cases where mesquite has come in and has left. These actually might just be overhanging canopies, though, in some cases. But overall, the general trend has been it, when it has come in, it's persisted. So the next step, I'm only, I'm only showing you um, data from, let me go all the way back here, from these blue quadrats. The problem is that even though all of them, well, most of them have been, uh, we, we have data at least for one year from every quadrat, every year that it was sampled, the sampling schemes have not been consistent. <laughs> So uh, Peter Adler, who's at the uh, Utah State, his group has done most of the digitizing. And he's tried to uh, do his uh, species grouping and using the species uh, designations similar to the first effort to compile all of this, which was done by Bob Gibbons. However, um, the, the, the decisions that people make when they do the compilation really dictates what we can do with the data. Because now, as, as Connie was showing you all of the different species that uh, we catalog now, we can ask more specific questions because we have data at, this, at a species level, whereas in the past, we might only be able to have it to a genus level or a functional group level. So um, as far, far as the next steps, uh, I think that the, um, the the scans that haven't been, or those charts that haven't been scanned, we really need to hurry up and scan those. Um, because even as, just, just looking at the, the charts, the, the quality of the pencil marks or pen marks really degrades over time. And this is gonna be a, it's gonna be a mountain of work to, to do this. Um, but we also have the ability to scan it in higher resolution than was scanned before. Then the question becomes, do we, um, do we want to go through and redigitize all of those scans, or are we good with the initial um, data collection that Bob Gibbons did? Well, in comparing the digitized uh, results to what Bob Gibbons did, this is just for one quadrat for um, five different grasses, you can see how they generally chart, or, or uh, generally seem to be the same. However, there's some big differences in some cases. And Peter Adler's group did some comparison. Um, it wasn't really clear how they did their comparison. And they came up with some big differences in some years, too. So I think it's at least worth checking where we have um, huge discrepancies in trying to decide 
where to go from, uh, from here. But if we did do the, uh, a whole, if we did compile the entire data set digitally, there'd be a whole host of new analyses that we could actually do. For example, instead of just having the, um, the data per year as it is currently now with what Bob Gibbons compiled, we would be able to look more uh, at a, a finer scale for uh, down to a month level or a shorter duration before sampling and look at environmental processes that was, were going on um, that may be able to uh, shed light on some new trends. So that's the current state of, um, of the quadrats. Let me know, happy to answer any questions you have. Yes. Has there been any discussion of uh, adding some additional methods to the quadrats? Like, I don't know, thinking about with the UAVs and getting some photogrammetry so we can start to look at solar elements? Yeah. There have been discussion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, you, mostly you have too many canopy layers. Yeah. And trying to do basal areas of grasses where it looks totally covered, but the basal area is very small. No other questions? Yes. Curiosity on the digitization there. I see some of these have uh, greater fjordness, I suppose, than you know, no distance between and, and line, line movement along. Some of these have uh, rather angular changes and others have yes. considerably less. So my question is what methods are they using actually for digitization and how how that might affect what you're actually seeing in the area because these changes could be dramatic. Yeah, so, so the way that Peter Adler did this, um, they took the scan, scan of the, um, uh, the chart and then they, um, they geo-referenced um, the one corner of uh, the, the chart and then mathematically um, set the other corner as one meter or, or the other. Uh, set the other corners as being one meter um, away from each other. And then they, uh, yeah, did, clicked around all of those polygons. So they and manually clicked. Manually clicked, clicked oh, yes. Yeah. But um, this, granted, I'm lumping uh, those grasses into native perennial grasses. So there's several different species actually made up in here. Um, the problem is that uh, it's hard to chart a certain singular species over the whole course because on some samplings, it's kind of it's lumped into another group or misidentified. But the cool thing here is in, um, where does it come in? In 1952, we see the first mesquite that's coming in. And here, it never, it never actually leaves. It gets, it gets larger. And the mesquite is canopy covered. The, the mesquite the is, basal exactly, yes. And um, some of them, uh, the, the quadrats get taken over by dunes, like the chart with blank and somebody writes, you know, covered by a dune on it, or they can't find a, um, the, the, the uh, stakes um, because a dune is taken over and later the states are relocated or reset. But th there still is a mountain of work that uh, could be done to get this data set in, in better shape and also to make it available to others to use. I mean, other people have already used it this for a variety of different reasons, but, um, yeah, we still have a lot of a lot of legwork to do.